Hey everyone, David C. Anderson here coming at you from the Knife Center. And today we're doing a Knife AQ number 43, the Knife Series, where I answer all your questions, whether they're sharp or dull. This week, among other things, we're talking about machete axe hybrids, my thoughts on stuff like carbide sharpeners, and some of my favorite handle shapes of all time when it comes to folding knives. Let's check them out. I thank you everyone out there for submitting your questions to this series. If you're not familiar with what we do here, if you're interested in getting a chance to have one of your questions featured in a future episode, leave them down there in the comments section and we'll pull some good ones uh, as we go along, just like always. Uh, first question this week comes from Ismail H. Raposo. Uh, I want to buy for my EDC a better knife. I'm looking for an assisted one with a flipper opening and axis lock, but I see this isn't very common. Can you recommend one? Sure thing. Um, there, you're very right. There, they aren't. They they aren't many. There aren't many uh, of that style. And you didn't mention a budget, so I'm just going to show you kind of my favorite one, which happens to be a little more expensive. Uh, but that's not why I'm showing it to you, but that is this particular version of the Benchmade Vector, and it comes in about 285 right now. Made in the USA, you've got the 20 CV blade, 3.6 inches, recurve compound grinds going on, really cool blade shape. You do have a, that, uh, that recurve there, which can make it a little bit tougher to sharpen in some instances, but it's not super aggressive, so you can probably get the hang of it. Really nice handles. We've got uh, aluminum for the bolster, G10 behind that for the handle scales, axis lock like you mentioned, and this is an assisted flipper, assisted flipping axis lock. You do have, even have a little secondary safety there to keep it from accidentally deploying if you wanted to, uh, but really nice. It's not a super fast action, at least this one isn't, but I'm, you know, I'm curious as to why you're, you're looking for assisted in particular, one thing that can do depending on the mobility of your fingers is it can make it a bit easier to open since as you get to that certain point in the opening action, the spring will take over and finish off. The, uh, the reason you don't really see these as much, I mean, you, you, alluded, it to you, you alluded to it in your comments, was you kind of lose one of the benefits of the axis lock in that these take a little bit longer to close one-handed. You have to push past the spring a little bit, whereas on another axis lock knife, this is a non-assisted griptilian right here. You can do the flip open and flip closed. It's even faster to close without doing the flick, that sort of thing. But that's most likely why you don't see this sort of knife as much, but there are a few good options out there like this one and a few others. Next question comes from Ian Devira. He says, hey DCA, what's a knife you feel deserves more attention, whether it's because of how unique it is or maybe you just wanna shout out some love to a knife you personally enjoy? I love this question. Uh, we actually did a video at one point on kind of the most underrated knives, uh, but we were focusing on stuff under $100 in that video, uh, even though I did sneak in the, uh, the Hogue uh, X1 Micro Flip above that price ceiling. Uh, but by and large, we, uh, we kept those to under 100 bucks, but we'll leave a link to that. Unfortunately, that left out another knife that I think is very overlooked and undeservingly so because this is a very deserving knife. The MKM R Venus. It's a design by Lucas Burnley. You can see his kind of clean aquiline lines going on on this guy. Uh, 335 bucks for this fancier version. And maybe that's part of why um, they, uh, they aren't looked at as readily as some other things, but the base models without the carbon fiber and without the blade coating are just over 200. Uh, those come with G10 and a, a liner lock rather than the titanium frame lock you get on this one. But no matter which one you choose, I think they're really nice knives. Three point, uh, almost 3.4 on the blade length, full flat grind, M390. Excellent, excellent blade shape, useful for pretty much anything out there. Not super thin, but thin enough for most of your uh, slicing day to day. You got that nice crown spine on here. It's just a great shape. And I love the, uh, the Burnley design on the handle here. It's fairly neutral, even though it doesn't kind of round over at the back quite the same way as some other knives out there that we're gonna talk about soon, sneak peek. But it fits my hands very well. Not a proscriptive grip at all, feels very nice. You get the marbled carbon fiber in this case with a titanium inlay, but the black G10 versions come with a bunch of different nice uh, bright color options. 
It's just a really cool design. Great for EDC, great for being a little bit classier, even on those base models. And that's, a, that's one that I personally enjoy, that I think some of you folks out there might enjoy as well. All right, next question comes from Jeremy2. What are your favorite folding knife handles? Yes. All right, so when we're talking knife handles, I'm gonna get a little bit into a subject that kind of influences one of the reasons why I'm more of a fixed blade guy than a folder guy, even though I'm you know carrying folders far more often than fixed blades. It's that a lot of folding knife handles to me at least, they never, or a lot of them don't feel like they're designed to actually be comfortable when held compared to a fixed blade where you've got more latitude to do the kind of shape you want, the kind of swells and the curves you want. Just seems to, uh, you know, they're built to be used. Some folding knives are absolutely built to be used. Don't get me wrong. Um, but even some of those don't necessarily always have a handle that can come even close to a good comfortable fixed blade. So I've got a couple handles that I'm really happy with the comfort of that I wanna talk about. And there's a few others that, that's not so much the comfort, but some things that uh, you just mentioned favorite, you didn't say best in terms of what particular metrics. So I'll show some of that as well. Um, obviously the OpenL series is a great place to start. I love these handles. They're very comfortable. One of the most comfortable folders out there. This guy right here is the number nine, comes in about 18 bucks. You've got a three and a half inch blade, Sandvix 12C27 stainless. And you've got that classic, uh, I believe they're still beech wood handles that they use. No seams around the back since it's cut out of a single piece, not a huge gap here at the front. So there's not a lot to, uh, to pinch you there either. They just work really well. Um, I mentioned that first because if I don't, someone out there is going to complain and rightfully so, because they're very comfortable. But in terms of like my personal knife journey, this actual knife right here is one that really heavily informed kind of a lot of my, my thoughts on this real early on. And that's the Benchmade Griptilian. Uh, these days, a little bit over a hundred bucks. This is a older 154 CM version that I've, uh, clearly put through its paces, but it's been around so long, this knife has, that it can almost be easy to forget how kind of complex and how sophisticated the shape of this handle actually is. From a head-on profile, it looks fairly normal. It's just elliptical. But you get in there and it's an asymmetric curve going on. It's got the kind of shape that fits into a hand, into the palm of your hand very nicely. You've got a little bit of jimping in the right places for traction without being too aggressive. You've got that elliptical curved over back, which means even if your hands are larger than this handle, you can kind of hang off the edge without feeling cramped or anything like that. And honestly, that kind of shape is really where you see the benefits of an injection molded handle like you get with this Griptilian. I know it's not uh, as fancy as some of the stuff out there, even some of the stuff in similar price ranges to this knife, or even maybe a bit under in some cases, but a lot of times to get a, a handle shape, you know, I mean, the word I keep coming back to is sophisticated. There is a lot going on here and it would be a decent bit of milling to program this and, and to uh, machine the stuff out each time, I think. But you really see the benefits of an injection molded handle scale or handle material with this type of design, even if it doesn't feel as good as a G10 or a Micarta. A newer knife on the scene, also injection molded, that is also a knife, a folding knife that's very much built to be comfortable in use is the new Becker BK40 folder from K-Bar. 40 bucks for a uh, OS 8 stainless steel blade, about just over three and a half inches there. But like a lot of the Becker fixed blades, the real star to me have always been the handle scales and the handle material here or the handle shape here. Nice swells going on. You don't see that uh, nearly as much as I would personally like when it comes to folding knives. And in fact, it's very closely based on the uh, the knife, the fixed blades like the BK-16, kind of the mid-sized Becker fixed blades. And as such, man, it feels good in the hand, uh, especially when you move the clip down to the uh, tip up position for me. Uh, when it's out of the box, they come tip down and the clip is a little bit in the way for my particular hold, but tip down fixes, or, or tip up fixes that problem and it just melts right in there. You can really push through some work with one of these guys without fatiguing yourself nearly as much as some other knife handles out there. Definitely, definitely a selling point for this knife. Of course, one of the reasons you probably don't see 
contouring like this as much when it comes to folding knives is it does take up a little bit more room in your pocket. I mean, if you're, a, if you're a big cold steel knife fan, or by that I mean a fan of the big cold steel knives, this probably has no bearing on you whatsoever. But this is a fair amount to carry around day to day in your pocket for a lot of people. So there are some, some uh, thinner knife handles out there that I think do a really good job. And another one from my personal collection is this Benchmade Bailout, the aluminum handled versions with the M4 blade. I think they're really cool, about 220 bucks right now. And this is a, a really nice example of how to do a slim handle right. As you can see, it's not super thick, but it's contoured just enough. You've got some nice uh, chamfered over edges. And overall, it's just a fairly, not completely, not as neutral as the Griptilian, but it's a fairly neutral shape and a very, fairly classic shape. Sometimes like the classic shapes are best when it comes terms or when it comes time to actually use a knife. And this is one that has always impressed me by the feel in the hand, even in a heavier grip. A lot of thin knife handles out there don't do as good a job or, or can't even approach doing as good a job in the comfort index as this particular knife does. So I definitely recommend if you're looking for a slim knife uh, to that you still want to have a very comfortable handle, these are a great choice. Closely related is the, uh, the bug out as well, the Benchmade bug out. Same kind of shape going on, but you don't get, uh, the, well, there is a new aluminum version, but most of them aren't aluminum like this. I particularly like the aluminum on this guy. And last but not least, the Red Alox Swiss Army Knives. We've got a couple Knife Center exclusives, the Farmer X, Pioneer X, and Bantam Alox. This red is, fantastic. I'm just, I've been smitten with this red ever since we started getting these in. I'd be saying this to you if these weren't our exclusives, just the color on these, it's unmatched. It's jewel-like, it's vibrant, and it's just pretty cool. And you get a classic red handle on a Swiss Army knife that normally doesn't have a red handle. So that's pretty cool too. So those are my, uh, my several choices for favorite handles. This four? Five. Eh, that's the five, that's the, you know, on the edge there. I, I do like it very much, but it's not like part of my story. Yeah, yeah. On the edge. Thomas with the dad joke puns today. Next question, shall we? <laughs> Which comes from Mike Sensei. Uh, David, I have a question about sharpeners. I guess I'm not too skilled at whetstones and traditional sharpening methods. That being said, what are your thoughts on pocket sharpeners? You know the ones where you drag the blade across a coarse V-shaped medium and then fine. Are these any good or should I try again to learn the art of the whetstone or strop method? What is best? Thank you. Um, I'm, uh, you know, you guys know I'm a big proponent of knowing how to use a strop, not just for uh, maintenance, but also being a, a full on sharpening system, but it is a little more intimidating. Uh, so let's get to the first part of your question with the, uh, the carbide pull through sharpeners. I've got one of work sharps here. Uh, which is about 10 bucks, it's the Pivot Plus knife sharpener. And that price point here kind of demonstrates why these have been uh, so popular, I guess. Well, one of the reasons, that price point, they typically don't cost very much and they're also very easy to use. I mean, you, in this case, you set this on the table, they make others where you have the blade faced up and you move the, the carbides across it. But on this guy, you hold your knife straight up and down and just pull through. Now me personally, I'm not actually a huge fan of this style of sharpener in general, at least for most situations. And that's because these carbide cutters do tend to remove a, a good amount of metal or a lot more metal than most other sharpening methods out there in the process. Upside of that is you can go, you can get through some like a chipped edge fairly quickly, but what's left is gonna be kind of jagged itself, not very refined, which is why you'll at least see some uh, some of these units like this that do have a ceramic section on the, uh, the other side right next to it to hopefully clean that up a little bit. This guy even has a nice little diamond rod on the bottom, which is quite nice. You can use on serrations, that sort of thing. Very field expedient and easy to use and inexpensive. That's where these are, you know, really shine. But if you're, you know, you're not doing too well at a standard whetstone, the thing that makes this easy is you just have to hold that knife blade straight up and down. So rather than going to a whetstone or a strop, which you're already having trouble with, I'd recommend one of the, uh, the crock style sharpeners, like the two sticks that sit up in a V 
And I, I'm always recommending the Spyderco Sharp Maker because it works. Um, they're not cheap anymore, but they're not astronomically expensive either. But I want to mention another one, something to get you in to see if you have the kind of feel for this sharpener. And that's the Turnbox series from Lansky. This is the, uh, the Four Rod Deluxe Turnbox, comes in about $20. So very, very affordable. Comes with a standard block base right here and holes for two different angle settings. And the rods, just twist this out of the way, are stored in the case itself, which is pretty nice. You got a set of medium and fine in the white there. But the thing that's really nice about these is just like those, uh, those carbide sharpeners, these are very easy to use because you just hold the knife blade straight up and down as you go through your grit, grit possession, Posse pro session, apologies. Um, so I would recommend uh, going with one of these first before trying to dive back into whetstones or strops because I keep saying it, they're easy to use and they are very effective as well, especially for a $20 investment in something like this. Uh, for a few bucks more, you can get a version that has a set of diamond rods if you need to do a little bit more aggressive reprofiling on a blade, but check those guys out. All right, next question comes from Blood for the Blade God. Do you know any good machete axe hybrids under $300? Sure thing. Uh, so to me, I kind of know what you're talking about. Um, I've seen uh, some kind of weird hybrid things out there, uh, especially in the, uh, the untamed lands of Kickstarter these days. There's some weird stuff out there. But really, the, the Kukri style of blade, in my mind, already is the perfect machete axe hybrid. And you say axe, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about hatchet, really, not a, a big splitting or felling axe or even like a cruiser style, anything like that. Um, machete's the way, to, or uh, kukri style is the way to go. Um, think back to something like the, uh, the old Becker Mashax. It's right there in the name. They don't make it anymore, unfortunately, but there's a bit of kukri and bolo DNA in that. But this is your guy. I showed the Becker, uh, the BK21 Kukri last week, so I'll show something different. This is the Condor K-Tact to Kukri. It comes in about 123. Kind of a classic shape. This is uh, one of the, uh, it's a 10 inch blade here, so there are longer versions like that Becker. But you've got the slashing of a good machete and you've got some chopping power of a small hatchet all in one. And one of the nice things about this recurve blade shape is it adds a lot of power to your swing, especially if you learn how to properly snap cut with one of these, you can impart a lot of force with one of these guys. And in addition to that, uh, one of the disadvantages of a hatchet is if you kind of overstrike or if you strike at a too shallow an angle and you glance off, there, that, uh, the head on that hatchet is very easy to accidentally hurt yourself with. This is something that um, you know I saw over and over in my uh, Boy Scout days back in the day. Um, if you do that with this Kukri, it's a little less likely to happen, and especially on an overstrike where maybe you're glancing off the haft of a hatchet. If you overstrike on this, if you, you're not in the sweet spot, the edge might bite in right there. So it's kind of a safety hatchet in a way. But everything else about this particular design, I like very much as well. Uh, carbon steel blade, are they using 1075 or 1095 on this one? It is 1075, uh, which is good in this case. You want that little bit of extra toughness. You've got micarta handles, three flared tubes as well, which is great. So you can run a forward lanyard on this, which I always highly recommend. Butt plate at the back for a little bit of hammering if you need to do something like that. Nice crown spine here at the leading section so you can grab up there, use it for draw knife stuff as well. Just a really compelling package, including a nice Kydex sheath to go along with. All right, next question comes from Sean Fenske. Uh, I'm looking for higher end steak knives. I hate serrations. Are non-serrated steak knives a thing? I don't mind spending the money to have long-term use and knives I can sharpen myself, thanks. I am with you on the serrations front. Um, and I actually had a bit of a hard time myself just a sort of a existential crisis picking the steak knives for my household when my wife and I got married um, because I wanted certain things and I couldn't quite find it. So I did the real knife dork thing and wound up buying a bunch of uh, blade blanks that I customized and did my own handles on. But that is not for everybody uh, by any stretch of the imagination. My favorite one uh, that I know of right now from a production standpoint is the Viper Sakura series. It's a whole series of kitchen knives, but their steak knives 
are really excellent. Uh, prices on them, you said you didn't mind spending a little bit of money and that's good. A set of two of these is gonna run you about $140. A uh, set of four will be 255. And a few different wood handle options, nice graceful blade shape, that's Nitro B steel in this case, about four and a half inches. And it's got that awesome sweeping profile that is gonna be great when you go to cut steak on a plate or any other kind of like cutting board. If you're eating steak off a cutting board, standing by yourself in the kitchen, we won't judge you there. I've been there, my friend. Um, and the other cool thing is you've actually got named designers behind this. This is, the, this is a Jens Anso and Jesper Vaknea's collaboration for Viper. How cool is that? You can definitely see their style in this particular handle shape, especially. You got really nice details. The fasteners are fancy. You've got some engraving essentially here or some milling right in front of the handle scale that mimics like a forged texture without actually having a carbon steel forged knife. Just very, very classy pieces and no serrations. All right, now it is time for our Seth Says segment where we bring our uh, social media guru, Seth V in to answer one of his own questions for you guys. So let me go get him, be right back. Hey everybody, Seth V here. I'm back to answer another question, this time from Dustin E. He says, Seth, as the social media guy, I imagine you deal with a lot of photos of knives. Which knives do you feel are the most photogenic? This was an interesting question. Uh, kind of had me getting a little philosophical, in fact. Um, I think there are kind of two parts to this question because there are beautiful knives and there are beautiful photographs. And you can take beautiful photographs of not so beautiful knives. Um, so I brought with me today an example of a knife that I think is a pretty uncontroversial pick for a very photogenic knife. The Chris Reeve Knives Sebenza. Uh, this is a beautiful knife, but it's hard to say why exactly. I mean, we're sort of getting into subjective territory here, but one of the things that I think really helps make a knife appeal to a lot of different types of people is a simple design, but not a boring design. And uh, the Sebenza really exemplifies that because even though it looks very simple, just a straight handle and a simple drop point blade, there's kind of some extra stuff going on, some subtle things that really elevate it. Uh, for example, this handle, uh, the only straight line on this handle is actually the lock bar cutout. Every other line is just a series of intersecting curves. And uh, even though it kind of reads as a straight handle when you just glance at it, you know, from different angles and up close, you begin to notice its curves. And that's part of what makes a knife really photogenic. If it looks great through different lenses, different angles, um, which sort of brings me to the second point, which is what makes a good knife photograph. And for that, I had to talk to uh, the man that does most of the heavy lifting for our Instagram page, Matthew, our photographer here, he and I got to talking about it and uh, he said that really the three things that make the difference for his photography, the things he's really proud of are uh, the light, the composition, and the mood of the photograph. And even without a lot of set dressing, you can do so much with just the lighting and the colors and the lines of the knife and what exactly gets highlighted and what gets left in shadow. You can really make a knife picture very dynamic, even if it's just simply a knife lying on a table. So I hope that answers your question, Dustin. Thank you for asking. Um, I'd be really curious to hear everyone else's picks for photogenic knives. Um, please leave them down in the comments below, as well as if you have any questions for me specifically, you want me to philosophize about, uh, feel free to leave them in the comments below and uh, we will uh, answer them at a later date. Thanks, bye. And I'm back. And they'll never know that we filmed this out of sequence. Mm, not until I put that bit in. That's fine. Now we come to the lightning round for today. Uh, first question, Alan Moxley, been carrying, or sorry, buying a knife for a first time knife owner at work as a gift. You're awesome, Alan, keep it up. I uh, want something thin and light, and I want him to carry it every day. What would you give? And Swiss Army Knives, 
don't count. Man, there is one answer for you. Kershaw leak all day, every day. Made in the USA, 45 bucks. Slim, very, you know, it is very pointy, but it's kind of an office friendly shape. It looks almost like a fancy letter opener. It is refined, it is useful. It's made in the USA, like I mentioned, at that price point is very impressive. Stainless steel frame lock, assisted opening, of course. There's gonna be some people that really do enjoy flipping that blade open with that. Yeah, one of the, uh, one of the greatest office knives, I think, of all time, and something that a lot of folks here, especially folks who come to the knife center to work and weren't necessarily knife people before, a lot of them, at least half, I'd say, which is a pretty high margin, wind up getting a leak pretty early on because they're great. All right, next question, John Hensley. Uh, what knife have you had to repurchase the most? Whether it's because you've lost it, gave it away, sold and later regretted, or you just wanted different colorways, blade steel options, etc. Just curious. It is for me also the Kershaw leak. Uh, I've mo owned more leaks uh, than any other particular or any other individual knife. Eight or nine, I think. I'm trying to remember. I, I don't think it was more than nine, but I've I've had several of these over the years. Uh, my current favorite one is the marble or sorry, the carbon fiber with CPM 154 blade steel option. Comes in about 93 bucks right now. It's just a classic, gen even gentlemanlier version of the standard leak. And that's another area where I think this knife really shines. But I've done all kinds of funny things with some of the leaks I've had. I've tried to make custom scales and failed miserably at that to, to try and like get the perfect leak that I wanted that didn't exist. That's the one I've been looking for all along is that CPM 154 version. They just didn't make it at the time when I was uh, messing around with leaks, as they say. All right, next question comes to us from Prentice Goodwin. He said, you, or he said, you said, use a hacksaw blade as a striker, uh, blade side or spine. Uh, he's referring to, I talked about, uh, if you don't have a striker for your ferro rod or your fire steel, uh, a lot of uh, bushcraft knives will have like a crisp spine, so you can do that. But if you don't wanna use the spine of a knife, a, uh, a small bit of hacksaw blade will work great. And I'm talking about the toothy side, the, uh, the actual teeth will scrape fire steels really great. There's a lot, those little guys really can bite in there and throw a lot of good sparks. It's real easy to cut those things down to with like a pair of tin snips or something else, uh, sand down the edges so you don't have any like sharp points. You can make them so they fit in a little Altoids tin if you want, all kinds of good stuff. And especially in a small survival kit like that, you've got a striker and you've also got a tiny bit of hacksaw blade. Could be a handy survival tool as well. All right, next question is from Jason Bilner. Uh, is there such a thing as a powdered carbon steel? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the powder metallurgy stuff like S30V was really what kind of kick-started the, the knife era of powder steels. It's just, it just refers to the kind of construction method, we'll say, for lack of a better term. And you can make any steel pretty much, as far as I understand it, in powder metallurgy form, even classic 1095 if you wanted to. But yeah, there's, there's plenty of carbon or shall we say non-stainless powder steels. 3V, 10V, 4V, like that whole V family uh, is some poster children for that. Uh, my favorite right now is K390, which you can get on some of these lightweight Spydercos. This is the Indela, uh, which these days goes for a little over 130. Non-stainless powder metallurgy steel with awesome edge retention. Bit of toughness, not, not hyper tough, but certainly enough to uh, to get you through and certainly tougher than other high wear resistant stainlesses like S90 or S110V, that sort of thing. So yeah, short answer to your question, absolutely. Just gotta know where to look. Next question is from Joshua Sharak. Are black coated blades hard to sharpen and will the paint come off? Um, no, not really. Um, in terms of the, uh, the hard to sharpen because when you're coming in to sharpen, you're really just hitting the steel if you've got your angle right. And you'll just be taking a tiny, tiny little bit of the shoulder of that coating off. And it really doesn't matter what kind of coating it is, even though you'll have stuff like DLC, a diamond-like carbon coating, which is technically harder than steel, it's not really gonna actually increase your sharpening effort because you're not really sharpening a full plane of that material. Like I said, just kind of the corner of it as you go. Uh, will the paint come off? only on the edge that you're actually hitting the stone with. So not too much to worry about there, really. You can kind of treat it just like any other knife blade out there. No problem. All right, 
Finally, we come to our most serious question of the day, and I love this one. From our friend Brikrat, he asks, or he says, well, he says, then he asks, Thomas seems like a curmudgeon. Is he really? Yes. There you go. And that's all the time we have today, folks. <laughs> uh, as always, leave your questions down below in the comments, and we'll comb through for future episodes. If you want to get your hands on any of these guys, we'll leave links in the description to take you over to the Knife Center. Make sure you sign up for the Knife Rewards program so you can earn some free money to spend on your next knife when you buy one of these knives today. I'm David C. Anderson from the Knife Center, signing off. See you next time. And cut. There we go. <laughs>